welcome uh, Ed to our conference. Uh, Ed is the CEO of State House. Um, I've had the uh, pleasure and privilege of representing Ed and his companies over the last five years. Um, and we thought we'd do something really interesting. Ed was, uh, has been involved in one of the major uh, M&A transactions uh, in the industry in the last year, particularly in California, which was a combination of uh, Sublime, Urban Lease, Loud Pack, and Harborside into the uh, largest operator in California. It was an incredibly complex deal. Um, I had the uh, privilege of representing Urban with Ed. Um, so I got to uh, be on the front line and in the trenches with him. And I thought it would be a uh, fascinating uh, discussion to really share with everybody what goes has been involved in M&A in this industry uh, in particular. Um, just to set the stage, and then um, I'm going to turn it over to Ed to talk about his journey into cannabis. Um, Ed uh, started out in the consumer products uh, industry uh, over 30 years. Uh, you were a bit of an underachiever in college. You only went to Yale and Harvard, uh, so I'm surprised you went this far in life. Uh, uh, started at Goldman uh, Sachs and then um, went into the retail business, ended up becoming the COO of Patagonia and the CEO of FAO Schwartz. Um, Ed is uh, still on the board of REI and Vera Bradley. Just Vera Bradley? Just Vera Bradley. Okay. Um, so brings a tremendous consumer experience to the space. Um, but how did it actually happen that you, before we get up to this transaction, just talk about your journey, because uh, we met at Calix, obviously. Yeah. How did that all come about? You know, what piqued your interest in cannabis? Um, uh, you know, like many stories, uh, a headhunter called. Um, I had sold a company I'd been at previously and was, um, I think, you know, a couple months after that transaction, thinking about what to do next. And a headhunter that I've known for oh gosh, over a decade, called me up and she said, I, I got this opportunity, you know, it's a fast growing industry, you can build brands and, and set the operations and put your team together. And I said, sounds great, what, uh, what industry is it? And she said, it's, it's fast growing and you can lay out the technology stack and, <laughs> and put your team together. And I said, wow, terrific, well, what industry is it? It's really fast growing. I mean, three times, I was like, what is going on? And she told me cannabis. I had, I'd been reading about it, but I'd never, I'd never actually considered it. But then in talking to her, I, I kind of thought back to my Patagonia days and what an opportunity to create something like Patagonia in cannabis, a brand that matters, that resonates, um, where people want to work there because of what that brand stands for and the quality of excellence that the uh, products that the company produces. Um, so intrigued. I. I took that first step, and uh, here I am. And so you were at Calix for uh, 2018, I believe you joined the CEO? Uh, uh, October of 18 till uh, end of January of 21, uh, when I moved to Urban Lease. And uh, at the time, two states, maybe, they, um, they were in? No, uh, at the time, Calix had uh, operations in California. Uh, we had a lawsuit in Nevada. I guess that's sort of typical. Um, and we're pre-licensure in Massachusetts and Missouri and had operations that just went live in Ohio. Yeah. So you were there a couple of years. Yep. Uh, and then what was the call to, to go to Urban? What was the opportunity there? Um, so it came about, I was talking to some investors to raise capital and um, they already had um, some um, investments in California. So they ended up not being interesting, uh, interested in, um, in uh, Calix Peak, um, but um, a short time after I'd had a number of conversations with them, um, there was the uh, CEO of Urban Leaf was moving on and they called me up and said, hey, how about this? And uh, that was an opportunity I, I thought I couldn't pass up. And so uh, I made that move and uh, um, Urban Leaf was a, at the time a seven store chain Predominantly based in Southern California, uh, stores in San Diego with a couple up the coast in Grover Beach and in Seaside. Um, and like a lot of cannabis companies, um, you know, the overhead was too high, um, cash burn was tough. We, um, we moved EBITDA from a minus $10 million loss to a positive $1 million um, in that first year. Um, 
But that's the income statement, right? It's really all about the balance sheet in, in cannabis today, and that was still challenged. Um, we had a number of trips to the altar for uh, M&A, and happily with the Harborside team, it, it worked out. So when you joined um, Urban, were you joining with the mandate to do something, to do a transaction? Or was it more of, let's turn this around, see how we can grow? How did uh, this whole process yeah, start? Yeah, more the latter, although I will say the week before I started, I had the first call with a potential um, M&A partner. I was like, God, you guys are killing me. You know, I haven't even started yet, and we have this call. And, um, uh, and we had a number of other interested parties r literally the first week that I joined. So we hired a banker, um, BGP, David's here somewhere. Thank you, David. And, um, uh, and started down that path. So, you know, at the same time, we were busy as hell just trying to optimize the operations, uh, cut costs, um, and, um, and, and really position the company for a future um, in, in whatever form that, that might have, uh, have turned out. So uh, M&A was the logical end game for Urban Leaf. Would, it, would, it, would you say that this was more of a transaction out of necessity versus opportunity? Um, I think it was a mix of both. Um, we were capital challenged, but we, there were levers to pull, asset sales, things al along those lines. Um, but I think this was an opportunity with Urban Leaf, Southern California focus, Harborside's Bay Area focus, um, Loud Pack's brands that, that really created the right mix of assets and the right scale to be successful in California. So before you got to that combination, what was the, the, the thinking internally with respect to the board versus the shareholders? You know, you always seem, one typically has conflict you know, often, not everyone's always on the same page. You know, how did you guys come to this consensus that we wanted to do a merger as opposed to being acquired or, or go out and raise capital? How, how, how was that process? Capital involved? raising was gonna be a challenge for the, the company. So again, this seemed like the right call to optimize the opportunity for all those parties. That was a relatively easy decision at Urban Leaf, that this is what we needed to do. Um, and so th there was unanimity of the, at the board level um, and the common shareholders that this was, was the right call. And what was, the, what was the search process like? You know, was there, are, we want a minority partner, we want a majority, we want an equal merger, I mean, or was it, let's see what's out there? Well, we saw what's out there. I think we ultimately had seven written offers on the company with a pretty vast range of valuations, literally 2x. Um, and um, some were sort of dismissed relatively easily. Others were, um, uh, were really compelling. And we did go down to the altar with, uh, uh, with one uh, very compelling partner, and that ultimately fell apart. And then um, uh, Harborside came knocking a second time. And um, that proved to be the, the right call, and we, we moved forward with them. And um, how would you describe that whole process? Oof. <laughs> um, it, was, uh, it was never smooth until the end. Um, and that was actually a great thing, that once we were all aligned and moved forward, um, everyone was focused on getting the deal closed, getting the financing in place, and moving forward. But getting there was a real challenge. I mean, you, you, you know as, as well as anybody, Frank, you had common shareholders, you had debt investors, you had um, you know, ma multiple management teams. Um, it was a constant give and take, up and down. Um, we had a couple times we thought it was gonna blow apart. We had a couple times where we thought one of the you know, three parties was out, um, but eventually everyone um, everyone realized to make this work, you know, it's the old story. Um, everyone took a hit to get a piece of a bigger pie. And ultimately, I think the cooler heads prevailed. Um, not everybody, actually nobody was probably happy at the end, which probably means it was a good deal. I mean, it, it's complicated enough to do a, a simple sale, not, not a simple sale, a sale or a merger with one company, but you were dealing with Three, including yourselves, three companies. Sublime was already acquired. Yep. Um, and now you're negotiating with Harborside, you're negotiating with Loud Pack, and everyone's negotiating together. So you, you had multiple acquisitions going on, not just a merger, because you've got to 
diligence them, you have to vet them. So, I mean, how daunting did you, did you find that whole process? Because that is quite an accomplishment to, to merge those three in at once. It, it, took, um, it took everybody. I mean, we had calls with 25 lawyers on the, on the phone. Um, you know, what's, what's that song? Warren Zevon, send lawyers guns and money. I mean, that was kind <laughs> of, the, kind of the, the approach that we had to take. Um, because there was so much complexity uh, with, from investors, as I said, the regulatory markets, licensure, um, and, and just the, the relative valuations across the, the three companies and, and, and getting that right. Um, and then multiple bankers, uh, and investors had bankers, and the company had bankers. Um, so the deal fees for this thing were, were massive, but at the end of the day, I think we needed all those minds working together to, to make this happen. Nothing is easy in cannabis, and, and Putting together four companies was um, was a massive challenge for sure. What what would you say were the the biggest issues in trying to get this deal structured? Was it the, simply the valuation? Was it the ongoing governance afterwards? Or was it how to deal with shareholders who invested at X and now we're getting X minus Y? Uh, you know, all, all three of those. I think the the uh, the last one was probably the first hurdle we had to overcome. I mean, everyone agreed with the thesis, right, that we needed scale to be successful in California because that can drive efficiency. Being vertical would let us, um, you know, really drive gross margins, particularly at our own uh, 13 retail stores in the state. And then um, that combination would then let us attract a really strong team to execute and to be able to be effective. Um, so that was the sort of end game. Um, but getting there, um, it was kind of sequential. I do it in reverse order. It was investors and, and the note holders negotiating. Um, and, and that started at the beginning and really went up to the last hour as everyone tried to maximize their position. Um, but at the end, we were able to get it done. So yeah, talk, talk about each consti constituency. So the, the investors you had to start with, I mean, you didn't have a large, I mean, uh, investor group, not oh, daunting. I mean, you had a number of investors, right. but you know, talk about the process you had to go through to try to build consensus, because it's, it's difficult enough to um, you know, try to convince a few people to do a deal. So, well, at the beginning, you know, we weren't even sure, I wasn't even sure you know, what my role would be, right? With it, that, that hadn't been decided. So we were just trying to get um, uh, the deal done internally. And the approach we took was one of relative valuation, where we looked back on 2020 revenues and then applied a multiple to that across each company. Um, we just thought it was too complicated to use forecasts and, you know, are these legitimate, are they not, how we, you know, what sort of multiple do we put on these, on these companies, uh, all of which were kind of suboptimal in scale, but had, had great potential. Um, so that process was, um, uh, conceptually, everyone agreed to it, but the devil's always in the details, right? And, how much do you take off for this? And how do you settle this debt? And how much AP is too much and should be on the schedule uh, versus not? So that was just, that was just grueling heads down negotiation. And then, you know, who's the lead investor at each company, getting them together um, uh, to hammer out positions. And, you know, it got heated at times. Um, and um, how could it not? And as I said, a couple of times uh, we thought, um, different companies were going to walk away. Um, but in the end, um, sacrifices were made. And as I said, nobody was particularly thrilled with the deal they got, but the deal got done. And I, um, th that's what had to happen. You want more details or, or how do I, how do I, <laughs> I I'm sensitive to. <laughs> no, to no, uh, I respect that. No, but it, it was quite a process um, because you, you do have all these different groups that you have to create consensus, and that, that's a very, very difficult thing to do, as I said, with one company, yeah. let alone with yeah. combining. And it's not a linear right. process. You know, you have all these side conversations. Okay, these guys will go if we do this, and, you know, just all that back and forth, that horse trading, uh, you know, it's, it's the nature of these deals, but it was just so freaking complicated because of um, not all the groups were aligned, not all the groups within one company were aligned, their competing interests within each company and getting them to then come out of that uh, with the deal. It took, took months of negotiating. Um, but at the end of November of last year, we were put pen to paper and we announced it. Um, we were, one of the thesis was by achieving scale, 
we'd be able to attract capital, and that proved uh, to be true. We signed um, a deal with Polaris. Uh, thank you, Travis, is here today. And um, um, that uh, we were able to close that in February and uh, April in two tranches, and uh, that provided the um, kind of the, the gas for the engine that we needed to uh, to get going. Yeah, and and there's a, there's always some pocket of uh, malcontent, discontent uh, among shareholders, particularly investors, and uh, every deal has that. Yeah, and um, you know this deal was no exception, um, but. Uh, you know, you did round everybody up eventually. I think the other thing that's interesting on this deal that complicated it a bit is it's a cross border. You've got uh, Harborside being publicly traded in Canada. So there are issues that had to be dealt with with their investors in getting votes and in in information statements and navigating the securities laws added a whole complexity in, in several months, but we figured ways to, to shorten that time sure, frame. Sure. Um, so there were just a tremendous amount of moving pieces in this. Yep. Um, so t talk about how decisions were made, uh, not how the decisions were made, but you obviously became the CEO of the entire platform. Um, you know, what was that process like for you? And was it something that um, you were looking to continue on? I mean, this is obviously a daunting challenge. There's a lot to do. There's a big difference between what running a private company and a public company. Um, love to hear about how that's changed things as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, I was, I was hopeful of this. I, I kind of, people asked me early on, and I said, look, let's get the deal done. That shouldn't be a driver of this, right? And I, I, I wasn't trying to be a martyr or anything, but I just said, that's just going to get in the way. If we have, you know, dueling CEOs, you know, complaining or, or positioning um, for, um, you know, uh, the front runner status. And so, you know, I for one to say, look, that is not what should drive this deal. The economics should, the underlying valuations, L let's go there. And I think that was appreciated by the various boards. And so when the time was right, later in, um, in, uh, in the fall, um, I had a number of conversations uh, with some of the board members and, um, you know, they became comfortable with me through the process and decided that this was a way to achieve some continuity. Um, I had familiarity with the deal, I had a familiarity with the business, um, and th they, they made the decision that this made sense and so they would, um, they would put me in that role. Um, Mark Rabner, the uh, CEO of Loudpack, um, graciously agreed to support me as, as president of integration. He was with us for six months, he's a board member. Um, it was a terrific partner for me, very supportive, um, and uh, he'd been in a similar situation, um, so we really respected the chain of command, because that can be disruptive, right? If you're a Loud Pack employee and your former boss is there, you can have those competing loyalties. But Mark was very cognizant of that and always, um, always took a second position uh, to me on things. So I really appreciate Mark for all that he did for the company and continues to do for us uh, as well. And then Matt Hawkins of EEC was the acting um, CEO of Harborside, and um, he, uh, he was able to step down and go back to his investing um, job, and, um, uh, and I stepped into that role. So it was actually a relatively smooth process. What, what did you find was the greatest challenge in doing a transaction like this? And, and what were some of the deal breakers that, that almost came about that could have derailed this? Yeah, the deal breakers were really in the balance sheet, right? Liquidity issues, you know, massive amounts, of tax liabilities. Um, we all we all got them. Um, long dated AP. Um, investor, you know, crude liabilities. Um, all these kinds of things where you added them all up, and it was a massive number. I'm like, you know, wh what are we doing here? How do we how do we how do we cut these down so these aren't an anchor that's going to drag uh, drag this company down? So um, certain companies had more of that than others, and they worked aggressively over the fall to reduce those. And um, ultimately, every company got to a level where we thought, okay, with this capital and with this structure, we can move forward and make this work. But that was a, that was a hard process, because nobody really wanted to you know, spend new capital on improving their balance sheet to get in position to help the company be successful. 
I won't say nobody wanted to, but it was, it was a difficult decision to accept. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, you, you gave a, um, uh, a little shout out to Travis uh, at Polaris. Obviously that was a critical piece of the deal. Yeah. And um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, how that uh, process and the structuring of, of the deck came about. Sure, so, you know, again, one of the thesis was if we got scale in California, we could uh, make the company combined entity more attractive to, um, uh, to raising capital. Uh, our timing was good, right? A, you know, a few months later, uh, who knows uh, what would have happened with the increases in interest rate. But um, we, uh, we put that together and, uh, and worked closely with uh, Polaris, um, uh, backed by uh, the real estate assets of the combined entity, as well as licenses. And um, we've raised $77 million, 45 of that refinanced existing mortgages, and about 32 million hit the balance sheet as, uh, as non-dilutive capital. Um, so this was um, a win for us. We think we have a great financial partner with, uh, with Polaris. Uh, they're continuing to do good work. I've made a number of people have called me and asked, you know, what do you think? And I immediately do a uh, referral to Travis because they um, understood the complexity and, um, you know, it wasn't easy uh, all the time, but um, worked well with us and, uh, and we got a deal done. That's great. So, Ed, let's talk about, you end up closing the deal. Now the real work starts. Yeah. The uh, post-integration, trying to achieve the synergies. Um, can you talk about, you know, what was your plan of attack in, in assimilating three companies, four companies, really, when you add in Sublime? Yeah, I was thinking about this because I, I knew you'd ask me this question. Um, and, you know, what are the lessons that we've learned? I, I think I can say our integration work is, is completed. Um, and by that, I mean, we don't have duplicative operations anymore. Um, all the management roles have been filled out for a while um, and we've done most of the work. And if there is a lesson uh, when you do these things, uh, immediately, you know, what are you trying to be? We wanna be really good at retail and really good at wholesale branded business. And then focus and simplify around that. Um, and, you know, your customer is the most important part of this transaction, and they honestly don't care about your integration challenges. All they care about is, am I getting the same quality product? Am I getting it consistently and reliably? And am I having a positive experience in the retail store? So you gotta make sure everyone stays focused on the customer, because they're the ones who, who make this work. Um, and then the, the team, and, you know, California's a big state, so we had operations in San Diego, in Los Angeles, in Greenfield, in Salinas, and in Oakland, and, and stores uh, between the Mexican border and, um, and Oakland. And um, communication has proven to be perhaps the most important thing. It sounds kind of odd, but I think the ease of communication is really challenged these days with remote work, right? We came out of uh, COVID, Hopefully, we're out of COVID. Um, I got my booster on Friday. It wiped me out over the weekend. God, anyway. Um, you've got, we don't, we don't have one central office where everyone works in. So I'm traveling around trying to make things work. We have a lot of remote people. And one of the challenges I learned early on, maybe one of the mistakes, let's call it what it is, is I kept the small executive leadership team, my direct reports. And we'd meet every week and we set our KPIs and, and everyone's working, we're making good progress. We're doing the grim work of reducing headcount, over 200 employees let go. We're making strategic decisions. Um, distribution wasn't a, a, a key uh, area of focus for us, so we just moved on to Navis um, on October 1st. Um, what's the technology infrastructure? I'll, I'll come, come back to that in, in a little bit. Uh, do we have the right people in the right place? And it's interesting, over the last six months, a couple people were really good for the first couple of months and then not so good after that. I mean, it's really, it's a, a very accelerated process. Um, but what I realized, sort of, um, was that my direct reports, that wasn't enough communication from me. So uh, last month I expanded that executive leadership team to about 20 people because there were departments and people who were working remote, weren't in the office, who were like, you know, what's going on with this? I'm not hearing about that. So, uh, um, you know, it's like, okay, 
I need to have more people meet with me regularly so we can talk about reinforcing the vision. What are we focused on? We can understand common challenges. Uh, people can understand why their projects aren't being funded and whose is. Uh, and that's really important, right? I understand why we're supporting that. Why aren't you supporting mine? They need to know the decision. They need to be part of it. So they can go back to their teams and say, well, we didn't get funded, but here's what is being funded, and this makes more sense. Um, so that communication has really proved um, uh, to be of paramount importance. So I've really had to change how I normally manage and expand um, a, a leadership group. I have directors now in this executive leadership team. Uh, and normally it's a few VPs and, and various C-suite roles that report to me, but that I feel are able to carry that message out across cultivation in Salinas and manufacturing in Greenfield and the retail stores, um, the finance and accounting team that's spread all over the state, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's been um, kind of an interesting, and maybe an obvious surprise, but there's always something that hits you in the face when you think about it. You said, wow, I should have I thought of that. Um, but that relentless communication and just physically being there, answering questions. I mean, I do a town hall meeting with the entire company every month on Zoom and I open it up for questions. I talk for five minutes and then I answer questions for 55 minutes. And up until the last one we had last week, pretty tough question. I get it, right? People's friends are no longer at the company, jobs are changing, it's confusion, questions. But last week I feel almost like uh, the fog lifted. Most of the questions were around, are we gonna have a softball team in Greenfield? You know, can we do this at this store, it was really, I think, positive, forward-looking questions from the team, and I, we're not quite there yet, but I think we're starting to get more comfortable in our statehouse skin, and people are letting go of their urban leaf loyalties, their harborside loyalties, their sublime loyalties, and their loud pack loyalties, and really starting to come together as a team. And you know, that's fundamental to my job as a leader, is just being there in person, at the, from the most junior employee to the most senior and spending time with them and making sure they feel uh, I'm listening to them and able to respond and that we're staying focused on that common direction. It's hard. Well, that, that's, um, you're, you're actually addressing one of the things I wanted to ask you about was how do you foster, uh, not even foster, how do you create a new culture amongst these four companies? Because <coughs> you need one culture yeah. to really succeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the town meeting's one thing, but what other kind of things are you trying to do there? So, um, ask me again next year, if you invite me back. Um, we're just starting that process now. And the reason we waited six months is I don't believe you can talk to someone in, about culture while you're letting people go, you know, a day or two earlier. So, um, I think we're, uh, we've completed um, all the major and indeed the minor headcount reductions and so now it's like, all right, let's take a deep breath. The team we got is the team we got. And I feel very strongly about this. Something I, I learned at my Patagonia days is culture doesn't come from me. Um, the vision, the mission, the values really need to involve the employee base and find out what they want. Easy enough for me to sit in a room and write down, here's you know, some of those pithy slogans. You have those posters of everyone rowing and you know, pull together, great. But it's kind of hollow, and um, I really think it's important that retail bud tenders, um, cultivators, um, joint rollers, um, the van drivers, accounting team, everyone has, feels they have a voice and are able to participate in this, and, and then we bring it up, and then the managers and the senior leadership team get together and really work to distill it down, again, with them, I don't want to kind of go off into an office and have a puff of smoke come up and you know, here are our values. I want people to really feel they participated in this and these are their values. You know, I'm a, I'm a God, I just turned 60. I'm a 60 year old white guy and our, our employee base is inc incredibly diverse and my values might be quite different from theirs. And so um, we're gonna do this together and we're gonna come up with um, a compelling mission about what we want to be as a company what values are important to all of us um, operationally. Hopefully accountability, um, you know, the culture of getting stuff done and being able to focus. Um, and then, then we're gonna put those up on every wall, everywhere we can, and the most important thing you can do to build culture, it takes time, is just to 
be that culture, right? Refer to those core values. When I was at FAO Schwartz, every management team, I had a different person read the culture on the wall just to reinforce that this is important and these are the values and the, and the mission that we, we all subscribe to and this is what we have to live and work every single day. Um, and it takes time. Patagonia had an incredible culture, but it really took decades to build that. And Yvon Chouinard is an inspirational leader, for those of you who know Patagonia, um, but he was always consistent about what he wanted to do for product quality, product functionality, and the environment. And that was an incredibly powerful force for good in that company. And I, I'm working to make that happen at State House. Are you trying to get the employees directly involved in the process or with committees or things of that nature? Yep. Because you are, you know, you have these diverse groups. Yep. We got teams going out to the retail stores and, you know, our, our cultivation facility and our manufacturing facility and various corporate entities. And they're going to sit down and with a whiteboard and say, okay, what are you guys, what's a compelling vision? What should we be? What should we be concerned about as a company? What should we care about? And what are the core values that would motivate you as an employee? And then we're gonna pull all those together and hopefully it's, um, it'll be roll up the sleeves kind of work. Um, but I'm comfortable by the end of the year, we'll have something that we can then you know, go back to everybody and say, here's what we heard, how's this? Um, and then we have to kind of get people, what does this mean? Um, Make sure they understand it's not just words on a wall. This is how we have to act. Um, and if we do this right, this can be our superpower and drive uh, a successful company. Again, I, my Patagonia experience, it was so pervasive there in a positive way. And the three things that that brand stands for, quality, functionality, and environmental benefit, I think I've said this before at this concert, at this, uh, at this event, if you did one of those three things at Patagonia, you were good. So you never had to ask permission to do those things. So it fostered incredible innovation because you knew you were supporting the company's goals and objectives. And um, importantly, the supply chain knew that, so they would bring recycled materials because Patagonia would likely be an early adopter. And then most importantly, the customer became engaged because they knew that's what they could expect. So that's, to me, that's the power of a culture, is it's not just, you know, how you behave internally, but it's how you project through your supply chain, and most importantly, what you project out to your customer. And that's gonna be part of all of our brands and, and how we behave as a business. It, what, what is that, I mean, your, your Urban's uh, mission statement or, or mantra. Feel good family. Uh, yeah, yep. you know, do good, look good, look feel good, good, feel good. It's yep. like Mr. Rogers meets Kanye West. Um, so it's, it's an interesting mantra you guys have. Uh, is, is that the messaging that you're, you're trying to continue? And is, I, I know you told we, me the retail stores are all, other than one, will be under the urban yeah, brand. Yeah. So maybe we can also you know, talk about that. Yeah, no, it has to be, so one of the biggest challenges, if anybody here goes into a merger, two companies, three, four, um, is getting people to let go of their brand loyalties for it's just starting to fade now. And so we closed the deal April 4th, um, us versus them. Oh, they're telling me to do this. Like, no, we're telling you to do this. We're working together on this. Um, Urban Leaf is doing it this way. We're doing it that way. No, State House is doing it this way. Um, you have to create, what is State House? And why would I let go of my previous brand loyalty to glom on to this new thing? And that process takes time. And I think we're weakening the hold of people on their former brands, and we're just beginning to solidify their hold onto what Statehouse stands for. So I can't adopt the Urban Leaf slogan, because then, ah, oh, Ed, he come, came from Urban Leaf, it's just same old Urban Leaf. How do we upgrade that? How do we think differently and think new about it so we're not just, um, uh, you know, I'm not seen as, as driving favorites. Uh, it's astonishing L little things like changing the email addresses of Urban Leaf um, uh, employees before everyone else because systemically that was the easiest first step, but that was seen as confirmation that I was a, a, a Urban Leaf homer and you know that I was uh, overly favoring these things. And you know, okay, I got to address this. Um, it just takes time and um, even staging, let's not do Urban Leaf first, let's do Harborside first so we can stop that. Um, there's some theater in this to, to make, it, make it go effectively. 
But suffice to say, we are not going to adopt anybody's existing culture. We're going to spin it into a new soup, and what comes out of that is going to be something great. So that's still a work in progress. Still a work in progress. Interesting. Yep. So the, the, let's talk about the assets that you've put together, and what does that enable you, or how do you feel that enables you to really be, uh, continue to be a market leader in the California market? And then we should talk about that a bit as, as to what you're experiencing there. Sure. So um, I think that was one of the compelling uh, value propositions of this merger. We had um, 230,000 square feet of cultivation um, in Central Valley in California in Salinas and Greenfield. Um, we had a 50,000 square foot manufacturing facility in Greenfield. Um, we did have distribution capability, about 18 trucks distributing all over California. Um, 13 retail stores uh, in California with one in West Hollywood uh, scheduled to open next month. Um, it's always alarming, having been in retail, pretty crisp schedules with retail store openings, but with cannabis, you're, I expect it to be next month, we'll, we'll see. Um, permitting and all those things are always a challenge. Um, and then um, nine brands, really six major ones that um, are distributed all, all over California. And I really like this collection of assets. We don't have too much of anything. And again, what I said earlier, we're really trying to be um, one of, if not the best retailer in California and provide uh, a very strong uh, house of brands, really focused on the bottom shelf and the mid shelf. Uh, I think we are gonna launch a, a, a top shelf brand, but that's not gonna be the driver of growth. Um, I think early on, everyone wanted the yoga mama, right? 150,000 household income, and she's gonna uh, uh, consume all this weed. But the, the bottom shelf, that 27-year-old guy who lives in his mom's basement and smokes weed every day, you can make good money su uh, supporting that customer, that consumer who knows what he or she wants and is a regular consumer of product. And um, we think we have the brand, um, uh, brands to do that and the supply chain structure uh, to do that. You know, we grow it, we manufacture it, and we sell it in our own stores. We're achieving mid-70s gross margin in California. Um, that's pretty solid in my book. So then the question becomes, what percentage of our private label brands do we put in our stores? And I think this is a, a, a challenge for all cannabis retailers, certainly ver vertically integrated cannabis retailers. Um, I'm of a mindset, well, let me take a step back. Urban Leaf, 40% of Urban Leaf sales have historically come from the Urban Leaf private label brand. Um, and this is really great because nobody else has that. It's only available in Urban Leaf stores. Really good price quality uh, relationship, no price pressure from outside, um, and we're able to uh, obviously control the quality and, um, and, and the, uh, the uh, delivery cadence, uh, in stock levels, and uh, promotional aspect. Um, in a highly competitive market, that helps set us apart. Um, rolling that model out to the Harborside stores is, isn't something you can do overnight. We can't just put 40% Urban Leaf product there and think we're done. We have to sell it into the bud tenders. Here's why Urban Leaf is compelling. Oh, cool, I didn't understand that. That, that is good, okay. And then bring it into the uh, customers so they understand it. Really get the customers to pull it uh, into those stores. Harborside started out at about 18% private label brands. Um, Chainwide, we're now about 36% of our private label brands. But that's a, a great gross margin driver. I don't think we want to be over 50% of our own private label brands because I think that detracts from the retail experience. People coming in, they say, oh, do you have CZ? That's the hot cart in California right now. Yeah, we got it. Average customer buys three units. What else are you going to get? Boom, boom. They buy one of our private label brands. That helps drive gross margin. They want Wild or, or Kiva. Um, you know, uh, some of the top edible brands. They want uh, Jeter's uh, infused pre-rolls. You need to have the top brands in there. And then you need to have that sense of retail discovery. Um, it's one of the things I loved about FAO Schwartz, right? We'd, we'd go to Germany and find these unbelievably cool toys um, and no one else had them. We'd bring them over and you'd see families. Oh, this is incredible. And, you know, you could buy Lego, you could buy Mattel, Barbie, Hot Wheels, but it was that sense of exclusivity that made people come back to that store over time. 
And so that's a responsibility to us. But we have to be fierce guardians of our shelf space. If a brand does not produce, and by that I mean our customers don't buy it, it doesn't deserve to be on our shelf. So we need to move on. Um, but we need to highlight new hot brands coming up that we can help launch. Um, local brands, um, social equity brands, um, all kinds of, of um, brand categories. We need to be uh, test, read, and react. Uh, put them up, see how they do, and go from there. So it's exciting to see now the big brands coming to us and saying, okay, um, we want to work with you. Uh, we understand you know, 13 uh, stores and what you guys are doing. Um, so we're working on exclusive products, product launches, um, really with the mindset of how do we work together with our brand partners to drive traffic to our stores. Because the California market is tough. There's a lot of new stores coming on and that sense of exclusivity to give people a reason to go to your store as opposed to someone else's, it's gonna come from our products and um, particularly our brand partners. That's so what we're working so on. St sticking with brands, do you, you and I talked a little bit about this, um, are you gonna look to go beyond California with your brands? Uh, so licensing, things of that nature? So we're talking to some uh, companies right now. Uh, actually, I've been quite pleased with the response uh, rate. Um, I think having brands that have been around for a while, I mean, Harborside's been around since 2006, opened that, that store in Oakland. Um, uh, Dimebag, Loud Pack, um, King Pen and Fuzzies, um, King Roll, very hot in the infused pre-roll category, which is a, a growing uh, and a very strong category in California. Um, I think being in California matters. Um, it's the best brand in cannabis, and I've said that before and I continue um, to believe that. So having a brand that comes from California I think gives you a heads up. Um, and for licensing to work, your brand has to matter. What does it stand for? Uh, what stories can you tell to support that brand? And then how are you able to support that brand in market? So what we're finding is um, you know, most of the companies want us to make sure we have someone, a marketing oriented person, boots on the ground in Massachusetts, in Michigan, in Missouri, um, who can support that brand and, and help drive product sell through and educate bun tenders on why this brand matters, why it's in the state and, and why it um, has unique selling propositions that they should be uh, passing on to customers. So we know it's a slog, it's not gonna be, oh, we're from California, we're awesome, here you go, and, uh, and sales are gonna materialize. Um, but boy, I like the foundation that we're coming from and that, that kind of initial uh, brand base. Because I think you know, 10 years from now, respectfully, what's a state that doesn't have weed so I don't insult anybody? <laughs> Iowa. You know, are you gonna, hey, come on over, I got some good Iowa weed. No, you're probably gonna, hey, I got some good California weed. Oh, no way, uh, yeah, let's come over this weekend and, and try it. I do think that sense of place, that, that history that California has with weed and the, and the skills and the genetics, uh, I do think that matters. And so I like, despite the challenges of California, I like being able to uh, have it be a base for our brands and being able to project out to other markets. And you know, we, uh, our panel earlier, the CEOs were talking about the branding. Um, you know, there aren't really any national brands, and I can imagine that it's it's a it's still a tough sell for you to d get those brands sold outside of uh, California. Yeah, we'll see. So we're in discussions with a number of uh, of uh, partners and. Uh, we don't have a deal yet, and even if we sign something, it'll be some months before we kind of get everything going. So it's a 2023 uh, initiative. And, and I'm not expecting huge revenues, but I do think if we can get our, um, some of our brands out in, um, in key states, it, uh, it helps seed uh, our potential to be national um, when the time comes. So Ed, you know, you, you're, you try to assimilate the, change the culture, create a uniformity. You talked about some other things you were trying to standardize within the, the company without getting too granular, but what other areas are important for people to learn about? So one thing, to put some things yeah, together? one thing we moved very quickly on was the technology piece and just getting access to the data. Um, you know, the technology stack in cannabis is, um, it's coming, but it's not really where it needs to be yet. So, um, this has been a key area of focus for us, just to help us get uh, the data. And you know, it's never fast enough, but we, um, 
in mid-August, we completed uh, rollout of uh, Leaf Logics across all 13 of our California stores with um, Jane Technology as the e-commerce interface and OnFleet as our last mile delivery module. Uh, so that's done. Um, this week, we'll complete uh, rolling out Canex as our cultivation ERP system. Um, I can't say that's done because I think it's Thursday, but we're pretty darn close. Um, and perhaps most importantly, by early Q1, we'll have, uh, I believe there were initially nine different finance and accounting systems, um, brutal, um, across a total of 64 corporate entities. Um, just a lot of the, remember the old days, plant touching, non-plant touching, license holding, operation, you know, all that stuff. We're slowly chipping away at those, but we had nine different finance and accounting systems we eliminated three the first week in October, and we'll be on Sage and Tact, um, I think, in January time period. Um, it's just going to have us have much better control of the data, one version of the truth, um, everybody working on the same information with rapid access to that information. Um, and crazy to think that it's taken six months to do that, but also I think that's pretty fast in the scheme of things, given what we had to work with. So that was a huge win for us, is to get on, um, uh, is, is to be getting on common technology platform. Um, um, that, I guess that's crucial. Oh, oh and, then, and then on the people ops, you know, HR, um, uh, absolutely vital. Um, we launched uh, corporate-wide 401k in October. We got up on um, um, common, benefits package on September 1st. Um, uh, we're already, I think everybody was already on work as a common payroll partner. So um, that uh, rollout was sort of, okay, I'm getting state house benefits, I've got a 401k, I'm getting paid in the same way as everyone else. That was just symbolically super important to get that done. And on your timeline of integration, I mean, what did you, forecast how long you thought it would take you to achieve some of these milestones and, and which are becoming the most challenging? Um, you know, it's funny, the operational ones are probably sort of the easiest, you know, the strategic decisions. Let's um, move off of doing distribution ourselves and move on with a partner like Navis. Um, that was a, took a month longer than we initially um, expected. Um, but we've been um, we've been pretty solid um, with our, um, our expectations on that. Of course, the board, being a good board, faster, 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 the employee base, oh my God, you know, we're going too fast. And they're both right. Um, and so my job is to, is to make them both uh, um, uh, accurate, I guess, at the end of the day. So, you know, I think we're doing well. I think we're doing really well compared to a lot of other merger companies, uh, merged companies in California, um, some of which have um, not done anything for a while. That was a strategic decision. I do think all that does is harden the existing brand relationships, and when you do integrate, just makes it so much harder for th those employees to let go. Um, because that process of letting go is, you're, there's a different manager, why do I want to follow her or him? Um, you know, I, I liked how we were doing it before, change management is the biggest thing. Um, and doing that in the midst of a really difficult market in California, I just think how much easier would this have been if market was growing 10, 12% like it was back in the day and everyone's just smiling and, and cranking. But instead, it's fiercely competitive. We're working to drive traffic to the retail stores. We're dealing with uh, AR challenges um, in the wholesale market. Retailers struggling to make their payments on time. Um, and you know that's a lot of change for the rank and file employees to deal with. Um, m even me, I had a full head of hair uh, six months ago. Um, so it's and you were blind too. <laughs> I, was, I, was right. I was fit, much more attractive. Um, you know, all those good things. So uh, it's uh, the, the change management piece and just getting people comfortable with that change. And you know, it's really about what's the compelling vision that you can let go. And I do think this culture work that we're about to uh, embark on. God, I wish I could have started it in May or June, but I just think that rings hollow when you're talking about culture and values when you're letting people go. I just think that's not 
you're not going to build a strong culture if you start right away in the midst of cutting people. Because for most employees, that's that's culture. You know how you how you how you treat people. And if you're talking about you know respecting values, and then you cut their friend, this guy's full of shit. Well, why am I going to follow him? Mm -hmm. um, so I made a decision to wait on that. I still think it's the right one, but uh, it's tough. So how do you view the, the California market today and how you're positioned uh, to hopefully take advantage of it? Yeah, uh, as I said earlier, I think we have the right collection of assets. We don't have too much in, in any one area. If I could add to anything, it'd be retail right now. I do think in California, we're likely in a declining comp store growth environment for retail. Um, so we're looking at acquisitions and you know, rather than, oh, this, this $10 million store is gonna go to 12, we're like, nah, it's gonna go to seven. And does it have a rent structure and um, you know, um, uh, payroll to sales and an operational structure that's gonna allow you to make money for wall contribution at, uh, at seven million? Because I, I do think it's a challenging market. 122 new stores open the first six months of this year. I believe there are 250 potential stores on the ballot um, this fall. While that's great for our wholesale business, that's a lot of shelf space that needs good brands, um, it's just a lot more competition for the retail stores. Um, and then on top of that is the illicit market in California. Um, somebody uh, just did some research on a, um, a web-based company that helps you find a retail store, I won't name it, and apparently there's 175 illicit stores on that site between San Diego and LA. 175, probably a multiple of that in, in reality. Um, and so, you know, this is something you compete with. Um, I, I check our reviews every month, a preponderance of five stars, we're doing great. There's always somebody who gives a one star review and says, don't shop at this store, they charge tax. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, God, you're killing me. And, you know, that person, um, I think, it's likely been a customer of an illicit shop for, you know, that was convenient to him or her and never had to pay tax and suddenly went to our store and, God, this company sucks. They charge tax. And you know, it's funny, but damn, come on. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot of work to do to educate uh, customers on, um, on, uh, on the options there. So um, if I could expand retail with decent stores and locations where we're not, LA, Orange County, North Bay, East Bay, Sacramento, I do that in a heartbeat, even though I expect those stores to go down a little bit. It's a brand outpost for us. We can show retailers in the area how to present our brands. We can drive gross margin dollars to our bottom line by increasing the level of our private label brands. And um, I think that's a, a very powerful, but the long-term um, market for us is um, growth vehicles, absolutely our brands. Uh, driving that shelf space and um, uh, really providing more than just product to retailers. But how do we get to vendor managed inventory programs? So the buyer, you know, right now is inundated with people calling, can just, you know what, 15% of my business comes from that state house company. I just sign the orders they submit. They pull inventory through, they deliver it. When they say they're going to deliver it, the quality level is good. That's a good partner for me. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. So Ed, what are your, your biggest concerns going forward with the continued integration with getting the, the brands out, just operating the business? What, what, what's the biggest concerns you have? Um, certainly access to capital um, is, a, is a concern. Um, the illicit market, it's really frustrating in California. I, I, I note they're making noises that they're really gonna be more aggressive on the illicit market. There was a great expose in the LA Times a month or two ago about how horrific these illicit grows are and the impact on employees, on the environment, uh, things like that. And Gavin Newsom just trumpeted, a, I think, a crackdown on an illegal grow in Northern California. About $15 million worth of cannabis was burnt. And okay, that's a good first step. Um, but you know, the illicit market in California is two or three X the legal market. And I've got a firsthand experience. We have a store in San Ysidro, right on the Mexican border. And on August 8th, 2020, um, law enforcement cracked down on about seven or eight illicit shops in Chula Vista, town right next door. On August 9th, 
our store business doubled, literally overnight, and stayed that way for about 14 months and before those stores opened back up, as well as a couple legal shops. So the impact, you know, if you're an event-driven investor, boy, just look for um, California law enforcement to really make an effort to crack down on, uh, on the illicit market, and the entire legal market will see a massive increase. Um, so we push, we try um, to uh, you know, convince our, our legislators to make that a priority for law enforcement, and I'm seeing some signs that they may be doing that. Uh, so we'll see. In early July, Governor Newsom signed a bill, uh, I think it was $30,000 uh, a day fine for illegal operators and their landlords. So that's new. Now, I haven't heard that's been enforced, but that's promising. So um, I think that's our biggest challenge um, kind of externally. And then just driving traffic to our stores, um, getting people to come in for a compelling vision. Um, some of our stores where they allow it are uh, open retail model. You can walk up and carry a little bag and drop it into your cart and then go check out. Other locations are still the apothecary model where you walk up to a counter and you have a bud tender. Um, I like a hybrid model, and so we're working to roll that out. We're trying to really figure out what our customers want is what's a next generation cannabis store and how do we do that with online order, in-store pickup, and uh, home delivery. We're not trying to compete with the big home delivery companies in California, uh, Ease, Amuse, you know, um, all, all, all those guys. Um, and we kind of don't have to because one of the big challenges for home delivery in California is uh, customer acquisition costs. If you're home delivery only, you're paying 30, 40, 50 bucks just to acquire a customer. And then you're discounting um, like crazy to um, you know, uh, differentiate yourself from your peers, some legal and some not. Really hard to make money in that model. With us, we're just thinking about expanding our four walls to the five zip codes around each store. And um, you know, we've seen a, a doubling in our Bay Park distribution um, by really making an, a decision to push that. Got a big banner over the store, home delivery, dropping flyers in each, in each um, uh, bag as the customer walks out the door. So they go home, take out their product. <laughs> oh, I can just go to this store, use the loyalty program, and I don't have to you know, worry about am I getting the best deal from X delivery company or Y delivery company. I can just keep doing business with the store that I already do business with. So I, I like our chances in kind of a... Who do you use for the d delivery? You can, uh, you, I'll tell you. We're doing it ourselves, again. But only in the zip codes around the five or six of our stores that have the density to make it worthwhile. I'm not sending people on 40 mile runs to deliver an item. That's easy. So you bought a uh, fleet of vehicles or? Um, we're doing it with- Independence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What would you say is the percentage you're seeing an increase? Because we always talk about delivery. Is it really catching on? Will people you know, go to the, want to continue to go to the stores or the convenience at home? It's about 10 to 12% of our retail business now. I think that'll go up closer to 20%. Um, and then we'll take a breath and see where we go from there. But um, we're off to a good start. That's great. Yeah. So um, with a few minutes re uh, remaining, um, and uh, I'll, I'll open it for some questions. But as I said at the beginning, this was an incredibly complicated transaction. So many moving parts, so many different groups. What advice would you give to you know, CEOs or head of M&A in the audience uh, about going through a process? Not, not that somebody's going to go through a four. Uh, company acquisition merger, but even going through a merger or a sale, what, what advice having gone through this experience can you share with them? Um, first of all, make sure you got first class advisors with you. So we had PGP and, and Frank and his team, absolutely invaluable. People who have experience in complicated transactions, experience in cannabis, um, and, and to do this right. Um, that was sort of job one. So I express appreciation to you, Frank. Thank you. And, Allison and, and, and the whole team who, uh, who uh, worked closely with us um, to help get this done. Um, boy, uh, you gotta be patient and flexible and um, keep the end game in sight. Uh, I, I think we founder, almost foundered a number of times because people wanted to win. And again, if the win is the end game. Actually, the, the win for all of us is another year down the road the way this deal was structured. Um, and so we're still working on that journey together now uh, to make that happen. Um, 
I think you have to be willing to let go of what you thought you were going to make from your initial investment or what you thought your position was going to be in this company. It is a very different market now than when most of these companies started. And um, that's kind of humbling and disappointing. But at the end of the day, at least on our deal in California, we think um, when, we, when we talked about uh, you know, being a positive EBITDA company in 2023, and if we can uh, lead the way in California, you know, California is slow growth, but we're adding a billion dollars in sales projected from this year to 2026. That's bigger than most other US states, and we're adding that onto four and a half billion dollar uh, market size. And if the illicit market is cracked down on even a little bit, um, you know, we are gonna be a very strong, profitable business with brands that matter. And uh, that's what we're focused on. Great, well, it, it was a hell of a journey. No, and, not uh, done yet. I pre <laughs> appreciated being a part of it. Uh, we do have a, a few minutes. Um, don't be shy, if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand. Well, we either wowed you or bored you, so it's one or the other, but uh, yes. Uh, yeah, the question was, how do I, how do we gather data um, relative to maybe to what I used to get? Uh, we're not there yet. Um, there's some cool stuff, um, a hoodie, um, of course, headset and, and BBS, uh, pistol. Um, you know, it's, it's a combination of, of all that data to figure it out. Uh, one of the reasons I like retail is because that's the customer, right? One of the challenges in CPG is, oh, the buyer loves us, fantastic but you don't know what the velocity of sales is on the shelf. What's the GM ROI, how fast that's turning. So being a, a retailer, we know what works and what doesn't. We know how the customer responds to, uh, to price changes. And what's been really great with our CPG sales force is sharing that retail da data with the salespeople. So, oh, uh, you know, we're, uh, we can't compete. Um, I'm, I'll make up a situation with uh, brand X. It's like, gosh, in retail, we have Brand X and our two brands, and those are our top three brands at retail. So in fact, they can coexist, and it's a different, oh my God, I never thought of it that way. So then they take that data out, and hey, for our 13 stores, this is a compelling product mix, and this is why you should buy our two brands to go with Brand X that you already have in there. That's a powerful combination that most buyers aren't hearing. So we're really trying to leverage the, the information, the skills, um, that we've garnered in, uh, in our retail business in, into, our, um, in, into our CPG business. Um, and I'd say, in terms of the data that we're, and the sophistication of what we're able to capture, we're probably halfway of where I, I'd like to be. Um, and some of that's on us, and some of that's on just the mm, capabilities uh, of companies in there. Um, I think we're getting better and better on the, on the sell-through and, uh, and market share data. Uh, I'd sure as hell love a, a Dun & Bradstreet in cannabis today so we can look at credit um, uh, across, uh, across retailers. Um, I suspect that's coming, but I, I haven't seen it yet. Business opportunity, somebody, anybody? <laughs> um, so we're, we're probably halfway where I'd like to be, yeah. Someone over here? Uh, oh, young lady go. back there. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask, you see a difference, you mentioned delivery and how you felt there was a little bit more overhead or customer acquisition. So here in Massachusetts, there's a couple of different delivery models and ideally they're made for social equity applicants to have you know, um, an easier route or entry into the cannabis space for less upfront capital. You know, and seeing how the market has matured in the West Coast, I understand as far as you know, products and getting things there, they allow white labeling and home delivery here. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit of that from a delivery standpoint, you actually find it more um, cost or more, more capital intense than from a wholesale standpoint? Um, so at the end of the day, I want to serve our customers how he or she wants to be served, right? So, you know, maybe this is um, simple, but they come into a store on a Monday and they buy something. On the way home from work on Friday, they quickly place an order and we're able to, uh, within two minutes of them pulling up, bring the order out to the car. It's 
some licensing challenges to that in some locations, but, and that's really efficient. And then Sunday afternoon watching the game, oh gosh, we're out, um, place an order, and, and that's delivered quickly. And I like that relationship, that we can be there for them um, in, in, in the way they want us to be there for them. And leveraging our loyalty program, we're, we've re revamped that, trying to make sure we're not accruing loyalty points on our balance sheet, but doing in a way that um, is sort of more immediately rewarding, uh, but doesn't cause our balance sheet to have to you know, register a billion air miles or, or whatever the, the airline companies uh, uh, did. Um, so um, I think we're, we've done home delivery out of a number of stores, but we're now doing it in a much more focused and I think more compelling fashion. And um, we're seeing good initial results, so, so we'll see. I do think home delivery, um, the challenge I think in Massachusetts um, is, is just gonna be, how do you make sure your, the economics work, right? And everyone's like, oh, we're gonna discount like crazy and we'll make it up on volume. Amazon did, but not too many other people else have. So um, I think you're making sure you, your costs are as low as possible. And um, you know, the nice thing about Massachusetts is good density of population. So particularly with gas prices where they are, I would think the um, economics um, would work. But just be careful about you know, the, the, the discounting in California has made it so challenging. Um, and a lot of that discounting comes from the illicit market. We had an illicit home delivery company set up in our parking lot in our Bay Street store. And a customer came in and said, I'd like to return this. And we're like, that's not ours. Yeah, the a, a home delivery right from your parking lot. And we like, went out and the guy saw our security team coming up and, and drove away. I mean, it's, it's so frustrating to have um, that level of illicit market in the state competing with you uh, with people who are used to not paying taxes. So I, I, I believe Massachusetts, you're not gonna have that, that hurdle. And um, well, and we, we, we recently had a uh, t-shirt company delivering to your house. You buy a $140 t-shirt and you get a pound of weed or whatever it was. So an ounce of weed. Uh, so that is going on. Uh, and that was only a couple months ago. Uh, so that goes on as well. It'll get better over time, but boy, it's, it's tough. Did you um, have a question? Was that helpful, I hope? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Now you. Yep. A multi-part question. Yeah, no, great question. Um, <laughs> it, it should be, right, because, you know, an, an OG Kush can have a profound effect on you with 18 or, or 20 percent THC because of the terpene profile. Um, that's much better than, you know, a motorhead at, at, at 31 percent THC. And I do believe it's coming eventually. And yes, you would think, oh, the California customers, you know, they're so sophisticated. But just look at the infused pre-roll market. I mean, these are 40% potency, and it is booming, right? Um, our, our King Rolls, our, our Fuzzies, uh, uh, Jeter's products, uh, it is one of the fastest growing uh, product segments in California. Having said that, I had a retailer ask us for sub-25 THC potency, because they really want to start pushing the terpene profile. So I take that as an indication that everyone's talking about this, but at the end of the day, it's what does the customer want? And I think that that bottom shelf, regular customer who just gets a tolerance for it needs that, that, that higher amount. The problem is you're really bifurcating the customer because the new customer coming in is, should be terrified of a 40% THC pre-roll, particularly if they smoked in high school. Oh yeah, I'll finish this joint and you know, how's it going? Oh, okay. You're, 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 you're down for the count. We'll see you tomorrow. Um, so, you know, we can laugh about that, but, you know, you hear too many stories of that happening, and it's not a pleasant customer experience. Um, so I think that's where a bud tender can, 
can come in and, and, and help with that. And, you know, I tell people, if you, the way to think about it is probably, okay, um, if you and I are gonna sit down and solve the world's problems, uh, great, I'd like a glass of red wine for that, right? If maybe we're gonna go to a club, a tequila drink would really be fun. And that's decades of experience that I understand that. In cannabis, most people don't have that sense of experience. What affects me the way I, that I kind of want to be affected? So that's just a question of time. But if your first experience is a 40%, you know, keef coated, oil infused, um, uh, you know, free roll, good lord, you're, uh, you're, that's a challenge. So I think as an industry, we really need to help educate people on, you know, where you are in that customer, sophisticated customer segment, and. Um, uh, it should be about not just potency, but about the terpene profile. And there's some people now talking about the plant botanicals that are kind of even more esoteric than terpene profiles. Maybe that's a good sign, or maybe that's, that's too far out. But I guess that my conclusion at the end of the day is California, people are talking about it, but the customer is still focused on potency. Well, it, we, my company was, was in, in an article, it was, uh, you know, that we, we were overstating uh, our potency. Uh, the question is over time, right? How old? You, you test it at release, do everything properly, you get the test results, and then if it sits on a retailer's shelf, over time, that is going to decay. So we're, we're working now on freshness as a key component because we're vertical. We're, you know, in our stores, our product should be less than 60 days uh, post-harvest. So we think that matters, and that will address that challenge. But you know, the, uh, the decline in, in uh, uh, really it's the terpenes that kind of fade over time first um, is um, something I think we're gonna have to uh, come to as an industry. Does it involve refrigeration? Does it educate customers on, you know, don't buy wheat harvested last October? And you know, it's like a, a, old yogurt. Customers don't want that, right? There's a, there's a fresh buy date, and then you move on from it. So I think the industry needs to be responsive to this and, and figure out a, a response on this. We are, we're trying. Great. Well, Ed, I, I wanna thank you. We've gone a little bit over on our oh, time. Sorry. I'm hopeful that uh, people saw a real insight into one of the most complicated deals that's been done to date. Uh, one uh, it was a, a privilege for me to be a part of and uh, they selected the right CEO going forward. So thank, thank you. you for being with us. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, That's great. That was a lot of fun.